Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to those who are joining us online and also in person. We're so, ha so, ha so happy that you could join us today. Um, welcome to this hybrid King County Library program, Meet the Poet with Sharon Hashimoto. Please note that this program is being recorded. Um, so I'm an adult librarian with the King County Library System and I work primarily in South King County at the Tequila and Virian Libraries. Um, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Fikret. Um, he's in the back. He'll be helping me out with Zoom today. Thank you, Fikret. I would also like to introduce you to Sarah Pate. She's the director of Washington Center for the Book. And this is a partnership with the Washington State Book Awards, um, as well as the Seattle Public Library. So the Washington Center for the Book promotes literacy and a love of books, reading, and libraries. So I'll be going over a few um, housekeeping notes for people who are joining us online. Again, please note that this program is being recorded. So if you do not want your face shown, do not turn on your camera. Um, everyone is currently muted online. Um, you're able to un unmute yourselves during the Q&A, which will occur after the presentation. You can send questions directly to me through chat or to KCLS Fikret, and we will hold them until the end of the presentation. If you are having any audio issues, you can also send questions to um, KCLS Fikret, and he'll be happy to help you. All right, so let's get started. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we present this program from the traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, who have stewarded this land for generations. And now I would like to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Sharon Hashimoto. Sharon Hashimoto taught composition and creative writing classes at Highland College in Des Moines, Washington for 29 years. Recently retired, she is concentrating more on her own poetry and fiction. She is working on a novel set in Seattle, 1968, and her short story collection, Stealing Home, is forthcoming from Grid Books in May of 2024. Her first poetry book, The Queen Wife, was co-winner of the Nicholas Roark Prize in 2003 and reprinted by Red Hen Press in 2021. That same year, her second collection of poetry, More American, won the 2021 Off the Grid Poetry Prize. More American also went on to win the 2022 Washington State Book Award for Poetry. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Okay, just trying to make sure everyone, can everyone hear me okay? All right, um, so I have to use the teacher voice to kind of project and make sure everyone can hear. <laughs> um, number one, I wanna thank the King County Library System in Tequila. This is a really awesome branch and I only live about two miles away from here. So I come here often and my husband and I check out books and return books and print things out. And I also want to thank uh, Ruth Fernandez and Sarah Pate for organizing everything. And I want to also thank all of those of you who are here. And uh, I was surprised to see how many people are going to be online. So hi to Homer, Alaska. Hi to Vashon. Hi to Bellingham and everybody else. And I also want to thank the Washington State Book Award and what they, uh, you know, all the categories for um, winners. You get these really pretty little stickers if you get them on your book. They also say finalist if you have one of them. And I was so surprised when I was told I won this award. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that there were other, there were four other finalists, and all of them with wonderful poets and wonderful, wonderful books. Uh, one person was Gary Thompson from Friday Harbor, and his book was Broken by Water, Sailor's Sea Years. There was also Kelly Russell Agonon of Port Ludlow, and her book was Dialogues with Rising Tides. Um, Catherine Smith was from Spokane, and her uh, book was Self-Portrait with Cephalopod. And finally, there was Andrew Robin from Lopez Island, and his book was called Stray Birds. So I want to start off by saying that they, they said I should say a little bit about myself. So I'm going to just start off and say that I wasn't always a good student or writer. In fact, being young, I was very marginal. I'd probably say I was meh. You know? <laughs> uh, but with age and practice, I got better. Um, 
I don't think I ever felt sure about what I wanted to be. At one point, I thought I might be a librarian. And at one point, I thought I kind of wanted to be a writer since I had a fondness for science fiction. I was reading people like Isaac Asimov and Brad, Ray Bradbury. Later on, I discovered Octavia Butler. Um, but you know, a key point is I knew I wouldn't be able to support myself. Okay. And that was a really important point that my family stressed, right? Um, so you have to make some money. Go ahead and do what you want, but make sure that you can support yourself. Uh, along the way, I played with the idea of being a reporter. I was really good at research, um, but tracking down people and getting accurate quotes, that really scared me, plus the fact that you were under deadline. So I kind of gave that up. And I also did technical writing for a while, but I got bored with just looking at all these computers and stuff like that, diagrams. I'm glad other people could do it. Um, along the way, I found mentors who encouraged me when I began writing poetry. I had people like Nelson Bentley, who is known as the father of Northwest poetry, and he taught night workshops at the University of Washington. Okay. Uh, he also had a wife who taught her own kind of class. And there were people like Jin Mitsui, who brought me into his poetry workshop, and Alan Chung Lao, who asked me to read for the International District's Flowers of Fire performances. So those are people who encouraged me and wanted me to get going. Um, when I was older in my 30s and finally became an MFA graduate student in poetry, Son Wong made me a teaching assistant in Asian American Studies. And then in 1989, I won the National Endowment for the Arts uh, for my poetry. And that was a big deal because it was $20,000, right? <laughs> and I know that one time, I, I, I think I heard this story right, but I think my father was on the golfing course and someone asked him if Sharon Hashimoto was the, po the poet was related to him. <laughs> and he kind of smiled and said, yeah, that's my kid. <laughs> you know? And I think about that point, I started thinking of myself as being a writer. Okay. So after college, I taught a lot of composition classes. I also taught some creative writing at Highline Community College. They're called Highline College now. And I did that for 29 years. So that's what I did to support myself. Okay. Um, I have to say, too, that I didn't really know how to teach, but my colleagues helped me out so much. And it came to me, you know, kind of late in my career, as I was grading papers with a bright red pen. And I realized that my students were teaching me with their mistakes, which were the same mistakes that I often struggle with on how to find the right wording, the right examples, the right, or, the right organization. I also thought a lot about how to avoid procrastination, which I, I'm sure is the same thing that they did. Okay, um, so there's an adage among writers that you should write what you know, okay? I've lived my entire life in the Pacific Northwest, never journeying very far from Rainer Valley. Um, you know, I remember forests without clear cuts. I remember hiking through the woods looking for mushrooms. I remember being at the ocean digging razor clams. And I feel real lucky to have such memories in abundance. Um, this probably shows how old I am, and I'm not sure if anybody remembers Emmett Watson. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Emmett Watson had a uh, he, a column for the um, Seattle Post Intelligence Center. And he was a big advocate of something called Lesser Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I was also a member of Lesser Seattle because what we did is we told everybody we knew that it rained too much in Seattle every single day. Mm -hmm. We told them that it was cold and dreary and how we hid in our rooms mm -hmm. because we didn't want people to come here. And I didn't want people to come here because I remembered the vast abundance of what we had. And, you know, I now there's clear cuts. Now there's a lot of people. But I definitely remember um, the Pacific Northwest when it was virgin and it was bountiful and it was beautiful. So I'm going to restart off with a, a poem called um, Foul Weather Bluff. And this is kind of like, again, some of the, the places where I've been. So at the foul weather bluff preserve, brown fog hangs over the water of Puget Sound as we emerge out of alders to advance on the beach. 
The two prone tracks of deer lie before us like string beads leading away. Our speakers skitter on slippery stones, eyes examining the sea rack tangled from tidal zones, oyster shells fused together, cockle shells that shatter like china plates beneath our weight, skeletons of sand dollars smaller than nickels. The stiller we stand, the more we can see. So many baby white crabs, then a clatter, a rattling trill, and a kingfisher dives low, warning us. The returning tide freshens anemones and colonies of clams as the sky clears to blue so bright, we shade our eyes with hands scratched by sand, full of what the sea has left behind. Okay. And one of the things that I was lucky to do is uh, we go clam digging. And this is the hard shell clam digging where you used a shovel, not the ones that you worked the tide and had to, had to reach into a hole and pull out this clam. Um, the poem I was writing really played around with a lot of sound. So you're gonna hear a lot of bees and I'm gonna have to slow down. This is called hard shell clamming. All day we bent beside barnacled tide poles, ebbs waving, beauty, I knew this is gonna happen. All day we bent beside barnacled tide poles, waves ebbing before dad's shovel. As the blade bit the cobblestone beach, dad bellowed, battling with a long-handled burden, a grunt bullied from his belly. We scrambled for bivalves, little necks, cockles, baby horse clamps. Above us, a bittern bleated. Bursts of seawater jetted from blue tinted shells that hadn't burrowed deep enough. How the buckles rattled and banged with each bank shot and blow of another clam. Dad's battery of pebbles and water scrubbed out our basin while the sun bronzed the back of our necks, sand rubbing between rubber boots and the bare skin of our legs but we didn't blanch or slow. In the bowl of the hole, we bragged about binging on butter and braziers, the boiling bisques of our labor. No barbs or bickering between us, we bumped shoulders together, becoming a buttress of siblings, bed but busy for this bipedal familial business. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, the next few poems are about being a kid. And so I'm lucky to have very strong memories of my maternal grandparents. And so um, my grandparents, the first generation that came over are the Issei. And um, I'm gonna say that I don't speak Japanese, but most of my Japanese vocabulary are family words, you know, like food words. And if I were to count them up, maybe 500 words is what I remember. So I know that hazukashi means shy. Takai is expensive. But I don't use these words often because they're fading. And um, I'll say that I went to Uwaji Maya not too long ago. And I was going like, what are those potatoes? <laughs> they're brown. They have rings on them. They're fuzzy. Of course, they knew what I was talking about. But I couldn't remember the name because it had gotten away from me. And I was looking for uh, Satu Imo or Tara wood. Um, but they, they they got it when I said those brown fuzzy guys, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I totally lost the word. Um, okay, um, sadly, my grandparents and parents are gone. And I remember how after my dad died and we were preparing his house for sale. And I remember standing in the kitchen. And as I looked at all the shelves with food on it and stuff like that, and I was telling, I remember myself that this was the last clear reminder I was going to have of all the Japanese food vocabulary that I had. So um, the next poem I have is like about being a kid and sitting with my grandparents. This is called Amen. As I sat across from grandpa at the tablecloth of red and white checkers, my fingers dusted crumbs off the vinyl where I learned to place a fork and spoon next to chopsticks on a napkin folded into triangles. In my grandparents' kitchen, I didn't know I was as American as the spit curled hair of the Campbell's kids, salt and pepper shakers. I sipped my milk from a Welch's jam glass. 
Grandpa pointed and smiled at the berets, parting and holding my bangs to each side. High tone, he murmured in his mangled English. I lifted my eyebrows, imagining the phrase. Grandma shuffled her zodis across linoleum, pushing up the sleeves of an Orlon sweater, throwing wood into a half electric stove where a pot of rice boiled. After fanning the flames to heat the cast iron pan, she added sliced rounds from a package of hot dogs. Grandpa puffed his spike from behind his nice newspaper, his Nikon Sheen Boom. The, the kitchen filled with the smell of St. Albert's and slightly charred beef. Grandma's hands added sugar, ketchup, a swirl of shoyu. Nothing tasted so good as sneaking bites of raw egg on hot rice the weenie mixture, and peeking at grandma's bowed head as she blessed our meal. Okay. Um, my grandfather had glaucoma, and so by the time, you know, we didn't have, he had a very mangled kind of English, so I don't remember him actually saying anything. He's had a few English words. And on top of that, he had glaucoma, which led to loss of sight. So uh, this piece is called What My Grand Grandfather Showed Me. His big hands outstretched, I believe those fingers could reshape shadows. His open palms push away the night as he reached for the chair's back, the blunt blade of a table. Everything was softer in moonlight. I didn't see his eyes, only the tilt of his head when he listened to the rug brush against his bare feet. Knowing I watched him, did he feel my breast thin release? Slowly, I let him guide me over walls and edges, the cool handles of the buffet. Exposed in the morning's harsh light, I stood in a room surrounded by his touch. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I remember how I was talking about the Japanese language. And so like, you know, my elders would talk to me and just kind of like looking at them, he kind of nodded <laughs> and said, well, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, a long time ago, back in 1965, in the International District was a Japanese um, theater. It was called the Kokusai Theater. Um, so this is called Kokusai Theater, Seattle, 1965. One, the aisle slants downward. In the dark, I could be sliding into the big movie screen where men with bushy eyebrows grunt, wearing kimonos like the women who clack their sandals with quick short steps, hiding hands in their sleeves. He pours into cups too small to hold. The husband speaks. His wife looks into her lap. The son's voice trembles. I think how everything is fragile in a rice paper house. Two, reading the English subtitles, the words don't match what we see. When the mother kneels beside the sleeping quilts to touch her boy's face, what she says isn't darling. Three, the story grows sadder and sadder. When the boy kneels beside his mother's futon, her breath slows, stops, her eyes never opening to see him. Suddenly, the theater fills with weeping. My grandmother's hand tightens on my arm. She dabs her cheeks noisily, blowing her nose. Around me, bunch hunch the old ladies I've just met. Kato, Matsudaira, cranky Lady Fukuhara, who argues over the price of shoyu, all are silhouetted in the dim light. I have a system. I'm just trying to make sure it works. Uh, okay. So here's a poem about, um, I think I'll just read it. So this is called Soft. And remember, I'm still from the perspective of a young girl. Soft. Who could sleep that night at my grandmother's on the sofa, tucked into afghans with crocheted coverings, that I used to pretend were twirling skirts. When a ruler of light leaked into the living room where I lay, I crawled out from the makeshift bed, setting one bare foot after the other 
on the brilliant balance beam until I stood before the bathroom and the vertical slice of a barely open door. Grandma was rising out of the steamy bath, thin hair slick smooth. Between strands, I saw her scalp, white and as peeled as a boil, as a peeled and boiled egg. The broad stalk of her back loomed into buttocks, black plump bags that hung over her legs. When she turned, breasts swung like socks stretched as far as they could go. I stared at the dark circles of her nipples pointing out. As she stepped out of the tub onto the mat, flesh rolled, escaping the water. But there was something gentle about the way an old woman patted the neck dry, rounding the shoulder with a faded towel, smoothing the tender spots inside elbows behind her knees. Baby Tuck spotted her skin as she rubbed the smell over the mound of her belly. In the mirror's light, I watched Grandma hold those wrinkled fingers high above her head, gathered around a tube of flannel, how the nightgown tumbled to her ankles, how the fabric swirled around each small step. So um, now that I look at it, I kind of realize that I'm that age. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing I don't have children. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid about what they would see. <laughs> so, and I wanted to do this poem um, for my dad. This is in Hawaii, we do this. No one wanted to hold my hand at Brighton Elementary when the wart appeared at the base of my ring finger. It was lumpy with ridges like the barnacles speckling ocean stones. I wore bow tie dresses with pockets, keeping my fists closed. And under pressure and the damp heat of my fingers, the wart dug in and grew. The doctor's going punk couldn't burn hot or deep enough. Maybe dad saw that I believed more in frog spit and the harsh words of my friends. In Hawaii, my father said, we do this and his knife split the eggplant. Two tear shapes fell to the side. Dad rubbed the juice into my hand. Then I followed him to the far corner of our backyard where the day seemed dim. No one would believe me, I thought, as we buried the eggplant. I smelled the earth as Dad's shovel camped it down. He nodded with the rhythm of his words. When this rots, your wart will die and fall off. All the way back into dinner, he held my sticky hand. <laughs> I don't know what he did, but it worked. <laughs> and I do have like a scar from those days when I had this work. I'm going to uh, switch now to uh, two poems from my earlier book, The Crane Life. And um, that's kind of what I want to do is I want to kind of show you a, a little bit of before and a little after. And uh, this poem was written uh, for a poetry workshop with Tim Stanford. And like a good teacher, he was trying to tell us that anything could be a poem. And in the front of the classroom, what he did is he brought this big toolbox in and he started taking things out of it. And at one point he stopped and he picked out a piece of barbed wire and said, I found this at the Heart Mountain internment camp site. And that's where my mother, her parents and siblings had been incarcerated. So this is a poem where the first line for the title is also the first line of the poem. Because you showed me a piece of barbed wire that had lain in the dirt road beside a lone sign, marking all that remained of barracks, road and eclipse by the shadow of Park Mountain, I thought of my mother beginning her tour of Japan. What would she say if she saw me with a piece of her past cupped in her hand? Would she tell me if the guard tower rose to her left perhaps to her right, as she stepped down from the bus, sleepy and holding her mother's hand? Or would something simply remain unspoken? On the plane, she would be napping, the pages of a sunset magazine fanned by her breath. The small shutters closed, the movie would flash by unremembered. But outside, clouds would buoy up the wings, buffet the metal. A suitcase in each hand, she'll wait patiently while my father scowls, passing through customs under neon signs she won't understand. Into Tokyo, they'll continue. I turn the knotted path of wire, smelling of ghost dust, touching the bars that held everything in.
And the second poem that I want to read um, from this collection is called um, Reparations, My Mother in Heart Mountain. Unrelenting, the sun breaks down the white paint, and the slight incline of the barracks tin roofs buckles or cracks with four years they have weathered. Dust and sweat shine like a cap of heat on the top of my mother's black head. Grit chasers' toes, her shoes scratch the rough door. So I imagine her at 13. Her memory blurs the exact picture with a few facts she can recall. And I ask her, what do you remember? She tells me, your grandmother made us think it was an adventure to hang blankets at night and make our own rooms, to fall asleep listening to the wind and each other's coughing as sunlight stilled the slits in the walls. Okay, important poem because I wrote that a long time ago. And a key point in that last poem is that my memories and impressions are not correct. Um, my mom wasn't 13, okay? She was more like 16, 17, or 18. I don't know why, but my feeling at the time that she told me and my impressions, I think it was the language that she used, um, that I thought that she was much younger. Uh, and if I look at dates, you know, she was born in, I think, 1924. So if you add it all up, she could not have been 13. She had to be much older. Okay. So something really interesting came up. Um, when I was working on my master's degree, I was also a teaching assistant in Asian American studies. Um, much later, I was reading Tetsuden Kashima's Judgment Without Trial about the, how the Issei, or first generation, were taken away by the FBI right after Pearl Harbor was bombed because they were the leaders of the community. And Professor Kashima was making a point about how younger generations had unclear information and impressions. And, you know, I was reading it, it's like, like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is really cool. And so, like a good student that I'd been taught, I turn to the back and I look at the notes, right, where you have all these um, stuff that you had about where did you get the information. And to my surprise, reparations, that poem was a citation. <laughs> I was the footnote. <laughs> so that was, you know, I was just kind of like, what? <laughs> I couldn't find any more information on it. That's what really disturbed me. Okay. Um, I can't remember exactly the year, um, but my cousin AC, who's here, thank you. And um, my parents did not go to uh, Minidoka, but a lot of people, a lot of the Japanese in um, Seattle went to Minidoka. And uh, we, took one of the um, uh, pilgrimages to Minidoka. And we got on a bus. We started in Bellevue. And the bus took us all the way to Twin Falls, Idaho, which was a heck of a car ride, bus ride. And along the way, we listened to the stories of those who had been there and were willing to share. And when we actually got there, you know, it was not the same, but it gave us an idea. And there was kind of a mock-up of the barrack. And out of that visit, I also did a lot of research and I came up with these, this next collection of poems. So the first one I'm gonna read is um, called The Barracks Window Outside Minidoka. And I'll probably wanna say that, uh, okay. it was hot, but I, it, was, it was kind of a mock-up, but I'm sure it was better than what was actually there. So this is a barracks window outside Minidoka. Not meant to last, the mean molding is slats of wood set side by side, where tar paper panels have peeled. All nailed with nine quick strokes, knotty pine boards patrol the porch, protect against glary glass-eyed glances. Windows widen at the top, the wind blows in round bits of sagebrush, nice ill-starred islands of indigo. Outside, night owls might dream, observe sun slow sink into shadow. Lanterns burn low, guards call, lights out. Um, we're starting to get into a little bit more history now. 
And I'm going to say that in 1943, the War Department and the War Relocation Authority joined forces to create um, a bureaucratic means of assessing the loyalty of Japanese and Japanese Americans in the camps. And all adults were asked to answer questions on a form that became known informally as the loyalty questionnaire. And responses to this questionnaire were meant to aid the War Department in recruiting Nisei into the all Nisei combat unit and to assist the War Relocation Authority in authorizing others for relocation outside the camp. So it was this um, badly worded questionnaire. And I looked at two of the questions, and this became um, the subject for the poem called A Matter of Loyalty, question 27. And as epigraph, I have the actual question as it's written out, which is, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And what you're going to find is like little bits of those are going to be buried in the poem. With a single light bulb burning over a table sawed from a crate, it's hard to read this question. How can anyone be willing to serve when guards, those shadows in a tower, warn us off away from barbed wire? Snakes slip under, back and forth to either side. While not holes in barrack walls let in dust, we stare at our one window where the only lock we can open is inside. To be killed or be killed by bullet or bayonet or bomb in combat duty? Who can raise a rifle? Peer through the sight, shoulder thumping at the recoil. Who can burrow into the blasted terrain, fire a flamethrower into a bunker whenever ordered? Neighbors murmur, bearing down on the tar paper roofs, the sun warms the rooms with a black smell. From day to night, there are so many shades of sky. Okay. So, Um, a huge part of the population who came to the United States settled in Hawaii, which is where my dad's from, and along the West Coast. So World War II brought my dad to Fort Lewis, where he met my mom. And before he died, my father told me a few stories, like how he'd been about 18 or 19, and a carpenter's apprentice who was supposed to go to work when Pearl Harbor was happening. And he lived on the other side of the island. And he said it was like earthquakes when the bombs hit. And it was just a good thing that he didn't go in. Um, my father also told me this other story, and it's written in pidgin English. Um, I'm going to say my father never got rid of his pigeon. It was always there. So give me a second, because I need to get into the voice. Letter to my father from his friend overseas, August 1944. Dear Isami, hey brother, it's been long time since you, me, and crazy guy Clyde walk out of old McKinley High. Remember playing pool, stick in hand, elbow in air, ball inside pocket on wall, how we see Uncle Sam. Eyebrows all bushy white, foot and finger, I want you. Good thing Clyde there dies, make him for F. Good thing your mother say, no, you too young. Recruiter give me stink eye because I Japanese. I member 100th Battalion, one puka puka. First we think uniform with arm patch, stripe make us look good. Here's secret, Japanese small. So small we wear girl clothes, blouses cut down. Sometimes we get special requisition. Combat boot, too big. Kilo guy wear a size two and a half. E, E, E. <laughs> Camp Shelby, Mississippi, meet all kind people. Mainland boys call me Buddha head, but I know pig. We Hawaiians call them tonk. You know, coconut sound hitting ground. Sure, they get confused. I say, you go, stay go. I go, stay come. He shake head, point finger that circle round and round. Other explain, you go ahead and go, and I'll come later on. Bum bye, we get along. And then we go to Italy, but vote take a long time. Zigzag around submarines, first 5D, me on top. Everybody sick, sick. No make fun, 
First time fighting, I get chicken skin, German tank fire, man next to me go down, arms, legs, all twisted like, blood all overthrowed. How? On, so fast. Okay then, I say to self, but lots more. Islami, this hard to say. Maybe you think, what's the matter you? Every day we watch high placed and broken building. We go face down in mud. Lucky one carried out on stretcher. Try pretend, try not ask. Today, day I die. Stay home, Isami, this for real. Your family needs you. No come, stay, long as you can. Your pal, back. Okay, and so everyone knows during the war what August 9th was. Nagasaki. Yeah, it's when they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. So um, this is August 9th. The poem is what we call an abecedarian, which is every line is a, a letter of the alphabet. So, after the flash, blasting flat, the shoji screams, brush stroke cranes, straining necks disappeared into ash. Mothers evaporated. Children floated on sides of buildings, ghosts of minutes before. Hail of light lingered, illuminating the cleared miles between blue jutting mountains and the horizon. Before the lover's kiss was complete, lips barely brushed, one mushroom cloud bloomed. Negative and positive burns outlined women's backs, patterns of water lilies or chrysanthemums, coats inked onto a scroll. Cries ricocheted throughout the ruins. Survivors stood, stuttering. So much was taken. Children sat hunched under broken umbrellas, rocking themselves. Vertical studs and walls creaked. Where would fireflies go? X-rays couldn't find them. Yanking on a barren branch, people discovered zero blossoms left to fall. Um, okay. So I'm moving on toward, you know, I'm a big fan of um, Henry Louis Gates' junior show, Finding Your Roots, okay? And I, I kind of think about history and I think about my family and I think about what's gonna go forward. Um, so this next poem is me talking to the fifth generation. Um, the Issei, as you kind of heard, is the first generation, the grandparents. The Nisei, the second generation, are people like my parents. I'm Sansei, third generation. Uh, Yonsei is the fourth generation, so if I had kids, it would be my kids. And Gosei, fifth generation, their kids. Okay, so if I had grandchildren, that would be the fifth generation. So this is called To My Grandnephew, Games of the Future. If I am gone 20 years from today, perhaps you'll find this photo, recognizing your little boy self, long before legs lengthened and voice dropped, not quite believing the thickness of your lashes or the swoop of bangs on your forehead. But who is the woman who holds you, you might ask, this matron on the edge of your memory? Her glasses slipped to the tip of her nose, speckled age spots glossing a cheek as she, reads, as she reads and points out the waves and where the wild things are. In the boat of her lap, your straddled calves rest on the knobs of her knees. Maybe you'll blink, thinking that boy can't be you, while the muscles in your right arm consider the arc, the heft of a stone skipped into the bay, hinting at what I once showed you. Right now, I'm here to say, you have big ears, like my own grandfather, I sometimes recall. That day, your shoulders leaned back into me, warm scent under my chin, slowly absorbed by the leaf pattern. I settled and sank into the chair. Okay. 
And I wanted to have a poem. I have two more poems left. Uh, I just kind of wanted to read a poem about family. <clears throat> so this is called Bad Name. It's dusk. The shadow branches of the plum tree inch their way across our backyard, lightly touching the bed net strung across the lawn. Mom, my big brother, and the baby girl of our family against dad and me. I extend my arm, feeling the stretch from my shoulder all the way down to where the fingers grip the racket. And there's a sweet bounce of strings. I think I'll skip this one. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. This is probably not the right poem to read today. I'm going to end with this one. And this is called Those Left to Tell for AC. The evil of Nigeria believe you're only gone when the last relative who remembers you has died. Dear cousin, we're old enough to recall grandma's kitchen. The knee-high bottles of orange fizz lined up for special meals on New Year's with the shrimp. Those stiff translucent shells we snapped in half. Her sink was wide and deep, big enough to wash my sister in. Fifty years, the largest anniversary picture, barely held us all while our numbers quickly spread, like ripples fanning far from shore. Only Auntie Mary lives on. My mom, your dad, a fading story that holds huge holes will never fully know. Memory makes of us brief cameos. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we appreciate you sharing a little bit about you, your life, and your family. Thank you. Um, so now we will open up to questions. Um, do we have any questions in chat? Or I can start us off. Um, oh, let me see. We don't want to stand like it. Yeah, OK. <laughs> it's kind of awkward doing the hybrid program. But um, yes, so you shared um, memories from mm -hmm. your parents and um from your childhood can you um go through like the writing process a little bit okay. on like how these poems are formed and what other resources we use okay um probably from oh i'm gonna say in my from about the time i hit my 50s i really started doing a big deep dive into uh sociological, psychological, historical factors of the internment. I had heard, you know, as you can kind of tell from the poems, I always knew that there was something going on, but I didn't know. Um, example would be is like my, um, this is pretty common, there was obviously when my mother was talking, there was like before camp, after camp. But you think about the word camp and you think, well, wait a minute, that's going to be like, you know, sleeping under a tent, under the stars and stuff like that. And they were talking about, you know, hanging up blankets for partitions. And so you always knew that something was wrong. Um, I, I think I'm most successful at poetry, which requires kind of like a feeling and epiphany uh, to putting together of images and sounds. And so a lot of times, you know, like if you're touched by an emotion or you see something, that's how you kind of put it together. I also write short stories, which I find really extremely successful because then I can kind of get more at a thematic message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could I could say, uh, uh, put yourself in the place of this character, what would they do? Um, and then, of course, I'm working on a novel now. So it's kind of like, it, it kind of, if I go back to like what I was teaching in uh, composition classes, I would probably say that there's a particular form for the different types of things that you want to write. So for me, it's kind of like the really emotional stuff would be more of the poetry. Um, you know, the stories would be kind of like more of a theme or a message that I want to get across. And who knows? I'm just making my way through a novel and learning as I go. Thank you. I appreciate that. Are there any questions in chat? Yes, yeah, kind of uh, related to that. Alan says, thank you for sharing uh, the various histories, Sharon. Um, is your writing process different for fiction compared to poetry? which came first before your MFA, and how has retirement affected your life? <laughs> <laughs> Three parts to that question. I can remember all of them. Um, 
I'm going to start off with the last is like, I would say I retired about four and a half years ago, and I am so happy. Um, you know, teaching was a part of my life, and I gave it everything I had, but that's over. And so I also say, too, that everything I got from teaching, I've kind of like applied to um, writing. Um, what came first? I think fiction. The first things that I got published were like two little tiny short stories. But then I became interested in the words on the page and how they sounded and how they looked. And so that's at the point that I started writing poetry and got involved with Nelson Bentley at the University of Washington. And you know that's also where I got my MFA in. And I'll probably make a little side here to say that I was actually working on a second MFA in fiction when um, the job at Highline came up. And so I kind of said, well, I guess I know enough to do what I'm going to do. And then I kind of stopped and went into teaching. And I can't remember the third part of the question. <laughs> The, the writing process, how it differs for fiction and poetry for you. Okay. Sometimes the poetry will give me an epiphany, um, a climax, a day in long. And so it's a way for me to kind of explore that. Generally speaking, I have a what if situation for the fiction. And I just kind of like, go through the numbers and like with the, you know, the historical, sociological, all that kind of stuff. Plus my, you know, parents and grandparents exposure to it. I, I kind of like figure out what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot more room in fiction. The poetry has also kind of taught me that when it comes to the words, it's like cut a lot of them out too. I, I don't really need it. So they kind of, you know, all the time it kind of works hand in hand. And I just have to kind of like, be excited about what I'm learning. Thank you. Yes. Can you tell us anything about the novel you're working on? Not really. Um, <laughs> I, I have I have a complete rough draft. Um, it needs a lot of work. Uh, for one thing, that as I go through parts of it, I need to get things, make sure things are historically accurate. And it's not, and I've, I've confused things. And so I have a lot more work to do to kind of straighten things out. So um, I'll be really happy when it's done. <laughs> Did we have any questions in the audience in person today? Yes. Um, hi, Sharon. Um, do you write every day? And so what's your routine look like? <laughs> <laughs> my routine is so kittenness. Um, when I was teaching, there were, I had, uh, the novel kind of came about three good summers. And what I would do is I literally, you know, because like after you teach, you only have three months. And so that pressure was really on me. And I would go to, you know, no offense to Tuckle Library, <laughs> but I would go to the Burian Library when they had study rooms. Mm -hmm. And I would have two hours. And then I would move around in that library. I'd, I'd go to the quiet room. I'd go down here. I'd go down the hall, um, street to Grand Central Baking and have a, just where I got chat. I mean, I got, I, you know, I had a donut and coffee and still work on it. But I did that for at least three summers writing. And I, and I would probably be at the library, oh, I'd probably say at least three to four days, at least a week. So that was when I was at my most stringent. Um, COVID hit. And it kind of like threw everything off. And my husband and I, what we do is we walk along the, the Green River, um, the Duwamish River. And a lot of times I'm thinking about poems or how to resolve something in a short story. But I, I have not been as diligent as I ever was during that time when I was going to the Des Moines Library, the Bavarian Library. I wish I could. But um, I think as you get older, you need more space and more time to think things out. With another okay. online question. Okay. Um, so Bob uh, says, hi, Sharon. I'm wondering if you would say a few words about who sees and comments on your writing before it's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm married to a, another poet, Michael Spiff. <laughs> he has five lovely books of his own. And so I would probably say he's the absolute first person that sees my work. And um, he's a good, I mean, let me just say that, you know, like 32 years? Yeah. Okay, when we were married? 
that you know we got married and it was kind of like we had to find our way to talk to each other about it and i'm going to say that there was fighting there was hurt feelings and stuff like that but over the years we've learned how to recognize each other's faults our weaknesses as well as our strengths and i would say that he's probably the best person to for me to go to i also have a writing group and they've been around for a long time and they're probably like my second tier of people who go to um and then sometimes i have other people who get this stuff but you know it's all kind of part of a process so i want to thank the deck of um they've been very helpful to me that's what we call ourselves um do you have any advice for people who are beginning to write poetry mm -hmm. Well, not even just poetry. Fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think I think one of the best things that you could do. Okay, two things. John Arrest told me this when I was in my master's program. She said, read a lot of junk. You read a lot of junk to know what works and what doesn't work. Even if 99% of it is junk, you can, you can focus on that 1% and say, like, that's something really cool. Um, the other part is that you have to fail to know what you're gonna be doing well. And so I guess the third part of that too is just write. Write, 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 write until you feel comfortable with it. And then when you're wanting to show it to something, say you're gonna fail, say I'm learning, say that's gonna have faults of it. Um, and also keep yourself energized about your writing. Because if you're not excited about it, who else is going to be? I like that advice. I feel like it, it can translate to a lot of different parts of life mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have another question come through? No, just a comment. Hooray for first readers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to say um, we do have five books available here for purchase. For those who are online, um, you can go to bookshop.org. That website supports um, local bookstores, and you can search for Sharon's book that way as well. Um, any last questions? Yes, Stephen. Sorry, um, no. your next book is coming out in May of next year, you said? Well, my collection of short stories. Short stories. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was very, very, I've been pushing that collection of short stories for a very long time. Yes. And, you know, I was a finalist for a lot of competitions and stuff like that, but it finally found a home. And I'm so happy about that because it kind of validates. I mean, I, I know I know I'm recognized as a poet, but I'd also like to be recognized as a short story writer. Sure. Well, congratulations. Um, on behalf of the library, can we invite you back next year? <laughs> Do I have any questions? No, Andrew. Well, I was about to ask if we were going to be coming back next year because they're what well, are some of your short stories? Uh, uh, the short stories about about a lot of things. They're about some of some of them are about the internment. Some of them are also about um, just you know it, it kind of goes all the way back to um, the 1930s, all the way up to the present time. So there's there's a lot of material in there. Um, and also you know a novel, even it's one year has a lot in it, but the short stories are smaller and I can kind of like focus on characters and what they're going through. And so I kind of have my heart on that, on the short story. Um, I did also want to add that I remembered um, because this is recorded, you are able to rewatch it. Um, so it will be on the Washington State Library YouTube channel in about a few weeks. Um, yeah, and if you want the link to that, um, you can just talk to me afterwards and I can get your email address. Um, but if that's it, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, Sharon. You. Thank we you. Appreciate you.